Thank you for joining us and thank you Kayvon and Demand Progress for organizing this timely event um, and to our panelists who are gonna be sharing their insights with us today. With the war now in its sixth year, a recent CNN investigation found that the US backed Saudi blockade has prevented fuel ships from docking in the port of Hodeida even after receiving clearance from the UN. This is leading to a massive fuel and food shortages across the country. And the World Food Program is warning that without urgent intervention, 400,000 children may die this year. And that's a shocking rate of one child every 75 seconds, roughly. WFP Executive Director David Beasley has recently said that, quote, the blockade must be lifted as a humanitarian act. Otherwise, millions more will spiral into crisis, end quote. This week, 76 members of Congress sent President Biden a letter urging him to push Saudi Arabia to lift the blockade in Yemen, while over 70 organizations and individuals also sent a similar letter to President Biden. Additionally, a group of Michigan-based activists with the Yemeni Liberation Movement are on their 11th day of a hunger strike in DC and are calling on President Biden to end US support for the blockade on Yemen. With that, I'd like to introduce our panelists today who will be sharing their insights on the legality and humanitarian crisis of the blockade, the US's role and efforts to end the blockade by Congress and civil society. So I'll start by introducing our panelists. We have with us Dr. Aisha Jaman, the president of Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation, and she has over 30 years of experience in public health, including 13 years with the US Centers for Disease Control. Dr. Jaman is currently working as an independent consultant, coordinating health-related projects in her native Yemen home, in her native home of Yemen, while um, where she has also worked with UNFPA and UNNDP. Welcome, Dr. Aisha Jaman. I'd also like to welcome Professor Martha Mundy, Professor Emerita of Anthropology at the London, London School of Economics. Professor Mundy taught in Jordan, Lebanon, France, the USA, and the UK. She writes on law and the state, kinship and family, and agrarian systems. From 2012, she has examined the impact of policy and war on Yemen's rural society and food systems. Welcome, Professor Mundy. Also joining us today is Bruce Rydell, a senior fellow and director of the Brookings Intelligence Project, part of the Brookings Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence. In addition, Rydell serves as a senior fellow in the Center for Middle East Policy. He retired in 2006 after 30 years of service at the CIA, including postings overseas. He was a senior advisor on South Asia and the Middle East to the last four presidents of the United States and the staff of the National Security Council at the White House. He was also Deputy Assistant Secret Secretary of Defense for the Near East and South Asia at the Pentagon and a senior at the North Atlantic Treaty Organizations in Brussels. Welcome, Bruce Rydell. We also have with us Mohammed Al Wazir, who is the legal director of Arabian Rights Watch Association, Arwa Rights, where he focuses on international human rights law and international humanitarian law. He also participates in UN Human Rights Council sessions. Welcome, Mohammed Al Wazir. And it's also my pleasure to welcome Hassan Al Tayyib. FCNL's lead lobbyist on Middle East policy. He has led lobbying work to advance a more progressive foreign policy in the Middle East and Latin America. He plays a major role in the successful passage of the War Powers Resolution to end US military aid to the Saudi UAE coalition's war in Yemen. His writings and commentaries have been featured in numerous news outlets, including BBC World News, The Hill, Al Jazeera, The Huffington Post, The Intercept, and more. Welcome, Hassan al -Tayyib. So we're gonna begin with a discussion of the humanitarian consequences of the blockade. And I'd like to ask Dr. Jaman, if you could please walk us through a brief history of the Saudi blockade and how it has impacted the humanitarian situation in Yemen. And I know you'll be sharing some slides. Thank you very much, Shireen. Uh, and thank you everybody who is on the call with us today. So I'll be talking about the consequences of the blockade on the humanitarian uh, crisis in Yemen. I always like to start by showing uh, Yemen. This is Sana'a City, it's a UNESCO heritage site. It's the, also the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. I wanna show that because a lot of people don't know how beautiful Yemen is and how much it has um, a lot of history and culture. So I wanna to start today showing, this is a UN tracking system that tracks items that get into Yemen. 
And we can see here from uh, July 2016 until January uh, 21, what's been allowed uh, to enter in Yemen. So the blue lines are food and the red lines are uh, fuel. What Yemen needs in fuel is here on um, the yellow line here. So as you can see, Yemen never received enough fuel that it needs per month. And there, since June of uh, last year, it's been receiving less than 8% or 4% of what Yemen needs. In terms of what Yemen needs in food is here in the purple line. And again, we see that a lot of the time Yemen does not get enough or not enough food is allowed into Yemen. And this is very important as we look into uh, what's going on in Yemen in terms of the famine. I want to show this one specifically because there's been a lot of discussion about fuel imports into Yemen. And this goes from January 2020 until March of this year. And again, remember that Yemen needs over 540,000 uh, tons of fuel. And this is what's allowed into Yemen per month from January 2020 until now. And you can see in February, there was zero allowed. And in March, only uh, 3,000 out of 540,000 metric uh, tons of fuel that's needed. These are some comments from the UN aid chief, Mark Lowcock, briefing the Security Council on humanitarian situation in Yemen on March um, of this year. He said, fuel prices doubled or tripled, pushing up prices of food and healthcare. Health facilities closing down in the last several weeks. There are 13 fuel ships waiting outside Hadeda, carrying enough supplies for about two months. On average, these ships have been waiting for more than 80 days. Actually, some ships have been waiting there for over a year, and two ships have decided they're not going to wait any longer and left um, the holding area at Jeddah port. All have been inspected and cleared by the UN verification and inspection mechanism. This is from July 2020, and I wanted to share it here to show that this is a chronic issue. This is not something that just happened now. And I have slides also of things that had happened in 2017, 2018. So it's not something that's new. So this is impact on uh, from July 2020, where the hospitals that had been uh, affected, there were 400 hospitals where they had to close or reduce services. Uh, 5,000 health center, all oxygen factories, especially now with COVID-19, 23 water projects, uh, 1,000 water projects, power off, off outages in all areas, interruption, of, co of course, of communication system. In addition, a limiting transport of 80,000 car cargo carriers, 70,000 uh, public transport, half a million private vehicles, and of course, destruction of agricultural crops. This is from a UN publication that came out uh, in March uh, of this year. It says blockade and conflict take a heavy toll on Yemen's economy. I just want to focus on the yellow part of it that says that the Yemen economy has been uh, shattered. And it makes sense if you're not able to import and Yemen imports 90% of its needs. Uh, since 2015, when the Saudi led coalition started the airstrikes on Yemen. Without lifting the blockade, the macroeconomy and stabilization, Yemen is going to be uh, declined even further. Experts estimate that Yemen will lose $181 billion if this conflict continues and the blockade continues. So how does all of this affect the Yemeni population? So Yemen has a population of 30 million people. Here, in terms of food security and agriculture, 16 of those, 16 million of those 30 million are food insecure. There are 20 million people of the 30 million who have problems accessing healthcare, water and sanitation, 15.4 million, and protection, 15.8. And uh, Yemen has the largest cholera outbreak in modern history at over 2 million suspected cholera cases, which is a shame on humanity given that we are in the 21st century. This is just some uh, reporting. Uh, famine has arrived in pockets of Yemen. Saudi ships blocking fuel aren't helping. Uh, and this is something that was documented by also other uh, UN officials. This was published in February of uh, 
18, 2021, which is again, UNA chief Mark Lowcock, where he says, Yemen is speeding towards the worst famine in the world had seen in decades. 16 million people in Yemen were going hungry and 5 million of those are just one step away from famine. 400,000 children under the age of five are severely malnourished. These children are in their last weeks and months. They are starving to death. So if he said they are, you know, have only weeks and months, this was in February 18. I suspect that a lot of these kids may have already died. This is again from WFP uh, chief saying one child dying every 75 seconds in Yemen on brink of a biggest famine in history. And that has not moved anybody to do anything about the blockade on Yemen, unfortunately, especially our government here. This is again, David Beasley said he was in Yemen in, in March and he said Yemenis are starving for food, for fuel, for medical supplies, for hope. These are two pictures of leukemia children uh, cases in Yemen. We support the leukemia center um, in Sana'a. Novartis had agreed to give us a donation of medicine for every leukemia case in Yemen for a year through the Max Foundation. This cost about $15 million. We have not been able to get this to Yemen for over a year. Families send me pictures of their dying children trying to, thinking that by sending them that I may be able to send the medicine in. I have not been able to send the medicine in. If we look at impact on women's health, uh, this, over, this is also from David Beasley. And on his recent trip in Yemen, he said over a million uh, pregnant women are at risk of acute malnutrition. Uh, I've been in many maternity wards and they are usually a place of joy. However, in Yemen, I witnessed devastation of malnutrition and hunger with newborn babies on feeding tubes and mother weakens by fear and exhaustion. Uh, every two hours, a woman dies in Yemen from complications of pregnancy. For pregnant women, severe malnutrition makes giving birth a life-threatening endeavor. Many women cannot get to hospitals uh, because they cannot afford um, to, to get there because of the fuel crisis and the distances. This is again from Mark Lowcock saying a massive famine is creeping into Yemen. We need to stop its, de its devouring a generation. A lot of people don't realize that malnourished kids actually have problem with cognitive development. So these numbers that we are reading of the millions of Yemeni children who are malnourished today, this is something that Yemen will have to deal with for many years to come. And this shows a picture of people resorting to eating leaves um, uh, to survive. We have actually worked in areas, and Aslam is one of them, where people were cooking leaves, bitter leaves, to eat to sustain themselves. Life under a blockade, um, this is again from Lokak. He said two thirds of people in Yemen are relying on aid. And I have to say here, aid alone cannot support a population of 30 million people. We need the economy to, to survive. We need the economy to be revived. We need the blockade to be lifted. Uh, nearly 50,000 50, Yemeni are already living in famine-like conditions. It, the blockade devastated the econo economy and crushed public service. Preventable diseases cause the death of at least one child every 10 minutes. Uh, we have the largest diphtheria outbreak in Yemen now. Yemen has not had a diphtheria outbreak since 1980. Sick children are turned away by health facilities that don't have med medicines or supplies. This is about Sana'a Airport that's been cl closed since 2016. This is from the New York Times, was published February of last year. It says, Mercy Flights leaves Yemen capital tracking a three-year blockade. Unfortunately, uh, these are sick people who need medical evacuation. The Saudi made a big deal in February when they decided to open it only through UN flights for those who are sick. Guess how many they allowed out? 27 children and their families, and that was it. Once they got the publicity that they needed, that they are allowing mercy flights, um, that was it. And then nobody talked about the fact that these mercy flights are no longer merciful and that they stop them from flying. 
Of course, now COVID-19 uh, is resurging in Yemen. Uh, unfortunately, the second wave is whelming uh, the medical facilities and a lot of the facilities, especially in the South, lack uh, oxygen. These are the number of cases uh, from the first wave. And you can see that the second wave is much steeper than the first wave. And uh, again, the medical services and the hospitals are not able to deal with that and also don't have enough reagents. I actually just got a donation from a German company for reagents for COVID-19, and we're trying to get it in through the World Health Organization. Thank you. This is my last slide. Thank you, Dr. Jaman, for this um, the horrifying insights into the humanitarian crisis that's been impacted, of course, by the blockade. Um, and I'd like to now turn to uh, Professor Mundi. You've written extensively on the food war on Yemen. Could you please speak more to this food war and how the blockade has affected food security in Yemen? And I'm, I, you're gonna have to unmute yourself, Professor. Professor Mundy, would you please un unmute yourself? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that was brilliant, yes. <laughs> I want to thank the organizers very much for the opportunity to participate on this uh, panel. And first I'll speak from my heart, which is that this war is a failure. And it has led, as we just heard, to enormous civilian suffering in Yemen, but need never to have happened in the first place. It has also led to the degradation of international organizations that are supposed to prevent such wars. But here I've been asked to speak about the food war in particular. I'll do so very briefly under three headings. First, a little background, which may complement, I, I think, what we've just heard from Aish Jamal. Then briefly uh, about the stages of what I consider the food war and where the, the blockade fits within that, and finally a short conclusion. First, a little background. In the early 1970s, Yemen was an agricultural country, unlike the other states of the peninsula. 85% self-sufficient in grains with a similar proportion of the people resident in villages. Yemen has a long historical tradition and a larger population than any other state in the Arabian Peninsula. And it is the only republic in the peninsula. I, that is to say, it is a country where the concept of citizenship is relevant. Yemen was incorporated into the wider regional oil economy from the 1970s especially during the 33-year rule of President Ali Abdullah Saleh from 1978 to 2011. During that time, Western-directed economic and social policies, Western-directed, caused the following, devaluation of local grain production, promotion of irrigated cash crops, encouragement of rural male labor migration to Saudi Arabia and the Gulf, change in food consumption patterns and the marginalization of women's rights and family planning. This together led to Yemen becoming highly dependent on food imports. The war came to Yemen in March, 2015, and from the outset, control was imposed by the coalition over the entry of persons, goods, and fuel to Yemen. <clears throat> the UN Verification and Inspection Mechanism, UNVIM, which we've just heard about, was established in 2016. It was established so as to offer an alternative to coalition control, but coalition control over shipping was allowed to continue in spite of that and in coordination with it. Briefly, the stages of the war. <clears throat> As the other panelists know only too well, kinetic bombing of military targets began in late March, 2015. 
but it was from the summer of 2015 that there was increasing targeting of agriculture, food distribution and processing, and productive infrastructure more generally, including fishing. That is to say, targeting of objects indispensable to survival or OIS in the phrasing of the Geneva Conventions, which is of course a war crime. From late summer 2016, Sana'a Airport was closed to commercial flights and further economic measures were adopted in the autumn. Notably, the move of the central bank from Sana'a to Aden, non-payment of salaries to government employees and difficulty for traders to access credit for imports, a really important thing. This led to increases in the prices of all imported goods, especially food. It should be remembered that the basic cause of all modern famines, beginning, let's say, with the famous Bengal famine of 1943, has been the inability of people to pay for the price of food and not the total absence of food. This is the major impact of the so-called blockade and its purpose. In November 2017, there were 20 days when no ships were permitted to dock in Hodeida, the principal port on the Red Sea. This caused a further spike in prices. Early in 2017, backed by the Emirates, forces seized the port of Mocha on the southern Red Sea coast. And later in 2018, a further attack on Hodeida was mounted but stopped by resistance and by UN mediator negotiation under Martin Griffiths. These campaigns on the Red Sea coast further devastated that most important agricultural area of Yemen, as documented in a study in 2017 by the Sana'a Dutch Flood-Based Livelihood Network Foundation, and in 2020 by a study by the Conflict and Environment Observatory. Sure, we can chart the level of destruction of agricultural production there. In conclusion, in short, I want to emphasize how the blockade is but one piece of what. In my 2018 report for the World Peace Foundation at Tufts University, I termed a food war. This has led today to somewhere between 60 to 80% of the population, i.e. virtually all the rural population, needing some form of food aid. Thank you very much. I'll leave it there. Thank you for that, Professor Mundy. And turning now to the legality of the blockade, Saudi Arabia has gone through great lengths to deny the legal existence of the blockade and uh, including just this past Monday when the Saudi foreign minister denied it during an interview on CNN. Um, the government of Saudi Arabia has continuously claimed that their actions are justified under international law. However, after the rise of an international awareness about the blockade and their weakened military positions, the Saudis, um, Sorry, uh, the Saudis have proposed a ceasefire agreement that included limited loosening of trade restrictions. And this offer was rejected by the Houthis, arguing that it was essentially the same as a previously rejected offer and didn't go far enough in ending the blockade. So Mohammed, I'd like to turn to you, if you wouldn't mind, to walk us through the legal context of the Saudi blockade and to explain the context of the latest ceasefire proposal within the larger peace process. Sure, thank you for that introduction and sorry for that, uh, for sharing the screen too early. Um, let me see here. Okay. Yes, again, uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, invitation to speak at this event, which comes at a time marking the beginning of the seventh year of war on Yemen. I'll just start out by addressing the second part of your question first by speaking briefly on the PC initiatives uh, that were proposed over the past year by the UN, the US, and most recently Saudi Arabia. 
And then we'll provide some legal context to the blockade, which is at the center of the party's differing stances on the prospects uh, for peace. So back in June 2020, the UN Special Envoy announced a uh, peace initiative called the Joint Declaration, which had three general tracks. There was a, um, a military track involving a uh, comprehensive ceasefire on airstrikes and ground fighting by both sides, and the establishment of a committee led by the UN to oversee the ceasefire. There was a humanitarian or economic track involving the opening of Sana'a International Airport, opening all seaports, including Hudayda, Isa, and Salif uh, seaports to all UN permitted ships. Um, there was a provision for fixing the Ma'rib Ras Isa pipeline and placing all revenues of the state in a joint account with the central bank, among other uh, uh, terms. There was also a political track involving the uh, resumption of negotiations on uh, lasting peace uh, made possible by a political settlement. Um, although the declaration was never signed by the parties, it formed the basis of backdoor discussions on how to make it acceptable to both sides over the past nine months. So on the one hand, the coalition backed Hadi government was concerned with its legitimacy and ultimately its authority. They demanded control over um, passenger air travel lists and the central bank. Um, account and the distribution of its deposits, uh, preferring it to be set up in the Aden branch uh, of the central bank rather than the Hudayda branch. Uh, this was the same issue that the Hadi government had with the Stockholm agreement that they signed in December 2018, which uh, included a, um, uh, a provision for uh, depositing port revenues in a joint account in the Hudayda branch of the central bank in order for payment of public sector salaries. Um, the humanitarian part of the Stockholm Agreement never saw the light of day, and today the issue of legitimate authority is playing out in the recent proposals as well, not surprisingly. On the other hand, the de facto authority in Sana'a, which um, some refer to as the, the, the Houthis, um, are of the uh, position that the humanitarian economic track uh, should be prioritized and um, you know, completely separate from the military and political tracks given the uh, dire humanitarian situation. Its viewpoint is that the humanitarian aid and commercial imports are the rights belonging to the people and should not be used as a card to gain uh, advantages in the military and political files. From a military standpoint, it seems that the de facto authority on Sana'a does not want to sign off on a ceasefire first, tying its hands behind its back while the blockade is in effect starving millions uh, and, and, and having to negotiate under those, uh, under that, under, under those circ circumstances. So Sana'a is now demanding that the humanitarian file uh, be treated separately from the military and political files. The stance also comes at a time when the de facto authority in Sana'a perceives itself to be in a stronger position than before, given its tested and increasing ability to strike military targets deep inside coalition territory and its continued advance on the ground, reclaiming territory the coalition previously controlled. Okay, so in came uh, the US Special Envoy with a proposal echoing the terms of the joint uh, declaration, more, more or less, and then the subsequent proposal by, the, by Saudi Arabia, which pretty much echoed the same. And here we are watching the humanitarian situation worsen as the blockade remains and as officials you know, deny it even exists. This brings me to the main topic I wanted to share with you, the blockade, which is at the center of whether or not a peace settlement can be achieved at the moment. And because the blockade is being denied, uh, it's an opportune time to discuss the development of UN stances with respect to the blockade over the course of the war. As we all know, six years ago today, on March 26, 2015, uh, the US-backed Saudi coalition war was launched on Yemen, employing unlawful airstrikes against civilians and civilian infrastructure and imposing an unlawful uh, aerial and naval blockade. During the first two years of war, the number of deaths caused by the blockade was neglected by the UN and media outlets, who instead were fixated on uh, airstrikes that killed 10,000. I'm sure you all remember that number, the 10,000, which remained unchanged year on year. Here it is, with a simple Google search. You'll find that up until January 17, 2017, uh, the focus was 10,000 deaths from airstrikes, which was terrible, but that was not the entire narrative. So in April 2016 and throughout that year, our team at Erwa sought out to uh, correct the narrative on Yemen by submitting five complaints on the unlawful blockade to the UN special procedures. 
specifically the UN Special Rapporteur on Unilateral Course of Measures and the Special Rapporteurs on Food, Health, Water and Sanitation and International Democratic Order. We submitted another two related complaints at the beginning of 2017. Um, and our complaint centered on two main points that can be summarized as follows. UN Security Council Resolutions 2140, 2140 and 2216 involve an armed embargo, asset freeze, and travel ban on five, na five named individuals. They do not sanction war on Yemen, nor do they make permissible the imposition of a comprehensive land and air sea, sea blockade that blocks commercial goods, such as food, medicine, and fuel, nor does it allow the blocking of humanitarian aid, obviously. While UN Security Council Resolution uh, 2216 may have been intended as a smart coercive measure, designed to place an arms embargo, asset freeze, and travel ban on five specifically named individuals, the actual use transformed the resolution uh, into a comprehensive coercive measure that violates the human rights of 30 million Yemenis. The complaints can be summarized in the following chart, which shows about a 50% decline in food, medicine, and fuel imports in the first two years of the war in comparison to year 2014. So right, up, right off the bat, uh, in the first two, two years of the war, there was a 50% decline, about a 50% decline across those three items. In May 2016, uh, the former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon announced the establishment of the UN Verification and Inspection Mechanism, the UNVIM, which was designed to facilitate the unimpeded flow of commercial goods and services to three Yemeni ports. Uh, and then in August 2016, the coalition effectively closed Sana'a International Airport to commercial traffic, which according uh, to local statistics, has resulted in the death of over 80,000 patients who required medical treatment abroad. And another 450,000 people await a similar fate. And to make matters worse, 120 uh, medications requiring uh, air transport are now unavailable. In November 2016, and after receiving the complaints from the UN Special Procedures, four UN Special Rapporteurs began investigating the allegations regarding the blockade by corresponding with the Saudi Arabian government. They said, regarding the aerial and naval blockade, it is reported that humanitarian aid into Yemen is being hampered by a variety of regulatory or even apparently in some cases arbitrary impediments from the coalition. There is a long list of vessels waiting to enter the ports of Yemen, and sometimes those which have already entered the ports are removed from the dock before unloading the goods. Moreover, there is an unreasonable delay and or denial of entry to vessels that have been inspected and proven to be not carrying weapons, and also for those that are suspected of carrying weapons. And so the blockade of Yemen is reported to have entailed serious humanitarian and socioeconomic uh, consequences on the Yemeni people as summarized by the panel of experts on Yemen, which uh, who said, the systematic and widespread blockade of commercial goods has directly contributed to the obstruction of deliveries of aid and humanitarian assistance while restricting vital imports of commercial fuel, food, and other goods not within the purview of resolutions 2216. And then in December 2016, at the end of that year, OSHA, the OSHA humanitarian coordinator in Yemen announced that a child is dying every 10 minutes from preventable diseases. And then in January 2017, the Saudi Arabian government responded to the UN correspondence admitting the following. The coalition to support legitimacy in Yemen has been careful to comply with international humanitarian and human rights law during all its military operations and its activities to assist the legitimate Yemeni government in enforcing the embargo on banned goods in accordance with the relevant Security Council resolutions. And then they went on to state that they issue permits relatively quickly and allow ships to enter. In February 2017, UNICEF announced that 63,000 children had died in 2016 due to preventable causes linked to malnutrition. And in April 2017, the UN, uh, the three UN special rapporteurs issued a press release demanding that the blockade be lifted. In it, they stated that the blockade involves a variety of regulatory, mostly arbitrary restrictions enforced by the coalition, including an unreasonable delay and or denial of entry to vessels into Yemeni ports. And then Mr. Jazadi goes on to state that it amounts to an unlawful unilateral coercive measure under international law. 
In November 2017, the Saudi coalition imposed a total blockade on, on ports, on all ports. Then in April 2018, they announced that it had reopened all ports, but the blockade still remained in effect up until this day, the full blockade, pretty much. So what actually happened, though, was that by April 2018, and according to local stats, about 247,000 children had died due to malnutrition-related diseases that could have been prevented if it were not for the blockade. So in August 2018, the group of eminent experts um, established by the UN Human Rights Council issued its first report, concluding that the Saudi coalition aerial and naval restrictions amount to a de facto blockade. The report goes on to state that no searches by either the United Nations Verification and Inspection Mechanism or coalitions force or coalition forces have discovered weapons and that no possibility, no possible military advantage could justify such sustained and extreme suffering of millions of people. The coalition has failed to cancel or suspend the restrictions as required by international law. And then in the, at the end of 2020, in December, the UN made a statement relying on the UN development program projections, concluding that the number of deaths due to the blockade was more than those caused by airstrikes. And it stated that the war had already caused, uh, had, had already caused an estimated 233,000 deaths, including 131,000 from indirect causes, such as lack of food, health services, and infrastructure. And then we have uh, that, uh, the quote that uh, Dr. Aisha mentioned um, by David Beasley from the WFP, who stated at the UN Security Council um, update, um, I'm highlighting two quotes here. He stated, he said that around 400,000 children may die in Yemen this year without urgent intervention. Th that is roughly one child every 75 seconds. So while we're sitting here, every minute and a quarter, a child is dying. Are we really going to turn our backs on them and look the other way? To add to all their misery, the innocent people of Yemen have to deal with a fuel blockade. For, for example, most hospitals only have electricity in their intensive care units because fuel reserves are so low. I know this firsthand because I've walked in the hospital and the lights were off, the electricity was off, the people of Yemen deserve our help. The blockade must be lifted as a humanitarian act. And this is our blockade monitor that we issue on a monthly basis. Um, and it basically shows you that there are currently eight ships, or at least from April 1st, there were eight ships uh, that were being detained. Um, it would have been 10, but two ships departed to another destination other than Yemen because it's, it was, they were detained for you know 200 plus days and 300 plus days respectively. Um, so they just went back. And that is the last slide that I have to share with you today. And I hope that uh, at some point in time, the war can end and the blockade can be lifted. With that, I yield the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for your uh, presentation. And in thinking about the US's role in the blockade here, as we know, President Biden has called for ending U.S. support for offensive operations conducted by the Saudi UAE-led coalition in Yemen. However, we still haven't received clarification on what the administration defines as offensive operations. So I'm going to turn to you, Bruce. You have argued that the blockade constitutes an offensive military operation. So if you could please elaborate on this offense, offensive military operation logistically, how does Saudi Arabia enforce the blockade? You know, what leverage does the US have with Saudi Arabia to stop it? And to also speak about the role of the blockade in the latest ceasefire attempt. Thank you for inviting me to this sobering, uh, not depressing uh, panel. I think we've heard very clearly that the blockade is the cause of the vast out of the humanitarian suffering. Not that the other Saudi actions don't also contribute, but it's the blockade more than anything else uh, that is literally uh, murdering uh, thousands of Yemenis uh, all, as we speak. What I'd like to do uh, briefly today is uh, cover three subjects. Um, 
Once, how is the blockade enforced? How do the Saudis go about doing it? Um, what is the U.S. role in that? And then finally, look at the evolution of the U.S. policy uh, towards the blockade uh, and more broadly towards the war. Uh, the blockade is uh, enforced um, by two mechanisms, by sea and by air. Um, as we've seen by sea, they prevent ships from docking and unloading. Um, since Saudi Arabia has complete control of the sea, uh, Red Sea, um, and there is virtually no uh, Yemeni Navy to deal with, uh, it's a relatively easy thing for them to do. But early on in the war, uh, the Egyptians also provided uh, vessels to participate in the blockade. Uh, I haven't seen any reliable reports that the Egyptians are still doing so, uh, so I think it is now virtually entirely a Saudi naval operation. But it's also enforced by air as well. Uh, not only is it enforced by keeping uh, Yemen's airports closed, uh, the Saudi's control of air over sea makes it impossible for any ship to try to break the blockade without being destroyed as it moves toward harbor or even when it's in a harbor. This is, uh, by definition, an offensive military operation. Blockades are in no way defensive. No one has ever argued that a blockade was a defensible act, a defensive act. It is an offensive act of war. Um, we've admitted it when we've done it. Uh, back in the Civil War, the North blockaded the South. It made it very clear that that was a part of an offensive strategy of strangling the South into submission. Um, what is the U.S. role? That's a little bit murkier. Um, we know that uh, at the beginning of the war uh, and through the Trump administration, the United States has provided intelligence support uh, to the Saudis um, through a mission in Riyadh. Uh, that intelligence support presumably included information on uh, shipping lanes, traffic in shipping lanes. The United States Navy dominates the shipping lanes of the Middle East, particularly the Bab el Mandab uh, and the Lower Red Sea. So it has a very good amount of information about what's going on there. More importantly, we can also see that from time to time, the United States announces that a US naval vessel has intercepted uh, a ship, often a Dow, uh, which they claim is carrying arms from Iran for the Houthis. Uh, I have no doubt that there are ships that bring arms to the Houthis from Iran, uh, despite the fact that Yemen is one of the most well-armed countries in the world. This really is our only competitor in terms of arms per capita. Uh, the United States and Yemen are in a, in a league all by ourselves versus the rest of the world. But I'm sure the Iranians are providing uh, expertise, uh, technical advice uh, for the um, uh, Yemeni ballistic missile program uh, for the uh, Houthi uh, uh, other weapons of striking back at Saudi cities. But what's clear after six years of war is that this blockade is not stopping that. Uh, maybe it's stopping some small percentage of it, but it's clearly not putting any crimp in the military capacity of the Houthis who far, if anything, getting stronger and stronger, not weaker and weaker. So whatever American support is, it's not working. This war is a quagmire in which the Saudis are bogged down and it's costing them a fortune. U.S., of course, also uh, contributes directly to the maintenance and support and the munitions that are used by the Saudi military. Uh, the Royal Saudi Navy uh, has some ships that are US made. The Royal Saudi Navy is the most diversified part of the Saudi military. They also get ships from France, uh, from the United Kingdom, uh, but a lot of the kind of close in uh, equipment that they use is US supply. And of course, when we get to the Royal Saudi Air Force, 75% of the Royal Saudi Air Force is American supplied, the other 25% is UK supplied. All the logistics, all the spare parts, all the technical support comes from the United States and the United Kingdom. If the United States ceased logistical support to the Royal Saudi Air Force tonight, it 
could be grounded um, if that's serious a problem. And you can't go to the Russians and the Chinese. You can't put a Russian radar system on an American F-15. If you can try, you better make sure that you have a lot of pilots with good health insurance programs because they're going to be using them up. Or we have immense leverage over the Saudis. Now, let's look at the evolution of American policy. Uh, the Obama administration um, went along with the war. Uh, was not surprised by the war. Uh, the Saudis told us what they intended to do. They didn't really give us much time to say yes or no. Uh, and it's clear that the Obama-Biden administration basically went along for the ride. Uh, it's very interesting to look at the memoirs of senior figures in the Obama administration. Uh, John Kerry's, Samantha Powers, Susan Rice. Uh, look at all of them. Look in the index. The word Yemen doesn't appear. There's like one mention in John Kerry's memoirs of Yemen. And that is to replay the Saudi line that it's the Iranians who started the war. Uh, it's really sad. Uh, given the role that they played then, and they put the role that they have to play now. Now, the Trump administration uh, had no second thoughts, uh, was an enthusiastic supporter of the war. Uh, Secretary of State Pompeo uh, even said that he was confident that sooner or later we would cut off the Houthis from all outside support. Uh, that turned out to be true, as I said earlier. Uh, whatever second thoughts Obama Biden administration had once they were out of office does not seem to have occurred to anybody. Trump, Trump of course, fully endorsed uh, the architect of this war, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, and tried to cover up as much as he could uh, for his role in the murder of Jamal. Now, the Biden administration has come in, and there have been some refreshing uh, changes. Most importantly, in his first foreign policy speech, President Biden said ending the war is an American priority. Uh, it's six years late, but finally an American priority. He has appointed a special envoy uh, who's now made three trips to the region. Um, and they have uh, said that the US will end support for offensive military operations in Yemen. Well, it hasn't happened. It just hasn't happened. The blockade goes on and continues to have at least passive American support, if not active American support. Um, the bombing of Saudi cities also continues to go on. Usually the Saudis are smart enough to say we're retaliating for a Houthi drone strike or something, but the reality on the ground doesn't really make much difference whether it's retaliation or not. The American approach has changed, but hasn't changed far enough. Uh, the United States hasn't sought to get UN Security Council Resolution 2216 replaced by a more balanced uh, resolution, one that would find that the Houthis are not solely responsible for this war, um, and one that would take away any legal jurisdiction for the blockade. It also uh, has an, a disturbing tendency over the last 60 days to criticize every Houthi action, but not to criticize Saudi action. Uh, the Houthis are constantly being blamed for prolonging the war. Now, the Houthis, as we all know, are not Boy Scouts. This is not a choir. Uh, they are a bunch of thugs. I'll be completely honest about it. But they're not the only thugs in this war. And those, their thugs, the Houthi thugs, the United States has no leverage over. And that's abundantly clear as well after six years. The administration's approach also has failed to de-link the ceasefire from lifting the blockade. And I think this is the biggest mistake. We need to de-link the ceasefire from lifting the blockade. The blockade should be lifted immediately. That should be the position of the United States government. That should be what we're advocating. If we can get a ceasefire down the road, all the better but we shouldn't link the blockade to the ceasefire. And I'll make one other uh, unrelated comment uh, before I finish. Um, Saudi Arabia, led by Mohammed bin Salman, has been responsible for this reckless war 
that has destabilized one of its neighbors. There are growing indications in the last several days that Saudi Arabia is up to the same thing, another one of its neighbors, neighbor to the North Jordan, which is also a potential conspiracy that has Saudi support, has the fingerprints of Mohammed bin Salman all over it. If there was any hope that he might learn from his mistakes and change his pattern of behavior, I would suggest to you that has proven a false, a very dangerous. Thank you so much, Bruce. And um, I want to turn to Hassan finally, um, and thinking about the role of Congress and civil society here. As we mentioned in our introduction this week, 76 members of Congress sent a letter to President Biden um, to push him to try to, to get him to try to push Saudi Arabia to end the blockade. And this was coupled with a similar letter signed by over 70 organizations and dozens of celebrities. Now, Yemeni American youth with the Yemeni Liberation Movement, like I mentioned earlier, are on their 11th day of a hunger strike to protest the blockade. So Hassan, if you can speak to these current and previous efforts from members of Congress, as well as civil society to end the blockade, push for peace, and kind of talk us through where you think um, we can go from here. Uh, thank you so much, Shireen. And to all my fellow panelists, I also want to Thank Demand Progress for putting on this event. Um, you know, I, I agree with so much of what was said already. Uh, the US backed Saudi blockade on Yemen is indeed a key driver in the humanitarian crisis that's pushing, you know, millions of people in Yemen to the brink of starvation and into starvation and into famine. And Saudi Arabia's tactic of collective punishment has been, you know, really unsuccessful in accomplishing battlefield victories, but has really cause untold human suffering for tens of millions of people and contribute to hundreds of thousands of deaths. Um, I wanted to mention uh, a few efforts that have happened. I think that that's been very uh, positive as far as, you know, members of Congress pushing on this issue. I'll uh, lift up the Kana DeFazio uh, member level um, letter to the Biden administration, trying to clarify some really important points. I think many people, uh, many staffers on the call uh, may have uh, you know, gotten their bosses onto that letter, and I appreciate that. Uh, a couple of the questions they asked were, you know, to the best of the administration's knowledge, what activities has the U.S. performed that have contributed to the de facto blockade on Yemen? Um, you know, uh, what, uh, are, what is continuing and under what legal authority? So I think that's a really key question. Unfortunately, we have not gotten a response from the administration. The date on the, the request on that letter to, to get a response by was, was March 25th. And we're well into April now. So that is a, a concerning issue that, you know, we just don't have the clarity. And so anything that we can do to keep raising up this issue and putting pressure on the administrations through additional uh, statements, uh, you know, staff to staff outreach is really important right now. Um, you know, I, I'll also just add that any information on the definition between offensive and defensive and trying to see how that fits into the blockade is really important too. Um, but to your point, Shireen, you mentioned the, the Dingle Kana Pocan letter that was circulated uh, for the past few weeks and just was released this week to the Biden administration. I think that was a really important letter effort, and I was really pleased to see that uh, over 70 members of Congress got on to that, that effort, uh, calling for what uh, Bruce said was needed, which is an immediate unilateral and comprehensive lifting of the Saudi blockade on Yemen. And that's per the exact right message right now. The blockade, like I said earlier, has been a leading driver of the catastrophe. And the WFP is saying that it's projecting that 400,000 children under the age of five could starve to death this year if, uh, if urgent action is not taken. Um, and uh, David Beasley is saying that the blockade needs to be lifted as a humanitarian act, and that was quoted uh, in the Dingle letter, which I, I think is so important. Um, now, I'll just note a few members. This is not a, a fringe position. Uh, on that letter, there were uh, folks all the way from Ilhan Omar to uh, Seth Moulton, Schiff, Nadler, Waters, Lou. So this was a really good cross-section of the Democratic Party on the House side. 
We'll also lift up that another letter, a, a civil society letter with a bunch of um, you know, prominent celebrities and activists sent another letter to the Biden administration, 70 organizations, including Bread for the World, uh, Demand Progress was a signatory, uh, Shireen signed the letter effort as well, Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation. And I, I think uh, that was another important one. We got a lot of media attention on that as well. So uh, it's unequivocal. We have members of Congress uh, celebrities, uh, Yemeni hunger strikers, and a large group of civil society organizations speaking out um, and really creating a broad, uh, a broad base uh, and a broad coalition that wants to see this done. Uh, now, I think uh, some key initial steps that people can take just on this specific thing is if you haven't retweeted or or shared a public statement about your boss signing on to that letter effort, please do so. Uh, amplify that as much as we can. Uh, and in a follow up note, uh, I think Kayvon will be sending out some materials and, you know, he'll send out the uh, Dingle and Pocan tweets. So please have your boss amplify that message or consider putting out your own statements. Uh, additionally, I wanted to flag that on April 21, the House Foreign Affairs Middle East Subcommittee, they're going to be doing uh, a Yemen hearing on the crisis, the political crisis um, going on in Yemen right now. I think folks should really tune into that. Um, if your boss is on the House Foreign Affairs Middle East Subcommittee, please uh, consider reaching out to the Friends Committee on National Legislation or any of the groups on this panel uh, to develop questions. Uh, for uh, the various witnesses and hopefully lift up the importance of, you know, ending the blockade on Yemen. So I think that's a really key opportunity that we can take advantage of. I don't know if the witnesses have been selected, but, you know, getting um, getting really great folks that can speak about the blockade. Uh, you know, I think I'd lift up any of the my colleagues on this panel to be witnesses. Now, um, I think what Bruce said about the UN Security Council resolution is also really critical to to lift up, you know, uh, you know, an urgent first step, like we've been saying, is just getting the Biden administration to call on Saudi Arabia to to lift the blockade immediately. But I think an essential next step, uh, you know, for for peace negotiations is for the Biden administration to push for a new, more balanced UN Security Council resolution uh, to replace 2216. Um, you know, the Saudis re seized on that resolution in their ceasefire, ceasefire proposal, demanding that the Houthis, you know, you know, what it says is the Houthis must give up their territory. But, you know, after six years of war, uh, the Houthis now control 80 percent of the country, 80 uh, percent of Yemen's population. And that U.N. Security Council resolution was outdated to begin with. But after six years, it's completely, you know, completely irrelevant. And it must be replaced. So I think uh, another step we can do is have members of Congress, you know, try to put out public statements to Linda Thomas Greenfield, urging that she push action at the U.N. Security Council to replace that outdated uh, resolution and, and get a more balanced approach to diplomacy. And, and I think it's important in the context of the blockade to mention Section 15, which really has been used by the Saudi-led coalition to legitimize not only its offensive operations, um, you know, under the guise of an arms embargo, but also, you know, to legitimize or try to legitimize their blockade on Yemen. Um, the, the, the quote from the actual resolution says, member states, in particular states neighboring to Yemen, uh, can ex inspect all cargo to Yemen in their territory, including seaports and airports. And again, it's been used as justification for the coalition uh, for their six year blockade, again, which has been a key driver of the humanitarian crisis. You know, I think Biden really must fulfill with urgency his promise to, uh, you know, end the war in Yemen and double down on diplomacy uh, before Yemen plunges further into famine. And I think a fair and just UN led peace process is paramount right now. Um, and and being being tough and actually putting pressure on Saudi Arabia and also lift up that Human Rights Watch in 2020 reported that the UAE is involved in the in the blockade on Yemen through uh, warplanes. They do, they donated 30 warplanes to um, uh, to the war in Yemen and also a naval fleet is kind of a black box around our information on the blockade, despite 41 members of Congress reaching out. Uh, despite the, a lot of pressure being, you know, put on this situation. 
and we just don't have the answers. And that's where you as staffers and members of Congress can help us get that clarity and, and really push on the Biden administration uh, to get the answers out there in public that we really need to, to move forward here. So uh, I don't want to say much more than that. I, I know that there'll be some great questions coming through. Again, I appreciate everybody for taking the time to be here with us today and, uh, and work on ending uh, you know, the Saudi blockade on Yemen and uh, you know, try to get Yemen back on a pathway to peace, diplomacy, and ending this humanitarian suffering. Thank you so much, Hassan. And I'm going to ask the audience to bring your questions to the Q&A. And while you do that, I want to return to our panelists, starting with Dr. Aisha Jaman, to give us some kind of a, if, a, if you have a key takeaway for us to keep in mind. Um, I'll start with you, Dr. Aisha. I think what uh, Bruce said, which is very important, is to de-link the peace negotiation from lifting the blockade. Lifting the blockade should be independent and should be done now. We know from all the wars that have gone in history, negotiations take years to happen, and uh, they don't necessarily end up in a resolution. Uh, so we cannot keep holding the Yemeni people hostages to uh, the negotiation. Lift the blockade and then have as many meetings uh, and diplomatic uh, pressure on everybody involved in this to reach a resolution to the war. But I find it extremely difficult to think that the world, including the U.S., think that it is okay to use the lives of Yemeni people as a bargaining chip. And we know that has not worked, and we know it's not going to work. So that would be my ask of everybody who uh, is on this call. Let's delink these two. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jaman. Um, Professor Mundy, if you can give us your closing thoughts. Uh, I think you'd need to unmute yourself first. Uh, yes, I want to back what Aisha Jaman has just said. And uh, I think it comes through also from what Bruce Radel has said that the Saudi coalition has failed in this war in spite of causing horrendous civilian suffering. The only winners in this war have been the military industrial complex in the US, France and Britain. Those are the only winners, not even the, the Saudis. Uh, the US, and so it's, as others said, the US government must end the blockade immediately. Uh, force the, that. Since the blockade degrades both the UN and the US, given UN VIM's cooperation with the blockade through information, and you, which is documented by Human Rights Watch, and US practical and diplomatic support for the same. I just want to mention that after the um, Houthis uh, refused the recent so-called ceasefire option, what did the Saudis bomb? They bombed a um, grain silo and a food processing plant north of Hodeida. Uh, just to give you the flavor, of it, the blockade is the most important thing, and delinking is the most important thing now to do. But uh, but just to show the bad faith of how you know <laughs> how did you select those two targets now, so to speak? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Professor Mandi. Mohammed Al Wazir. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to repeat what we uh, said when we were advocating on the Hill back in 2016 and 2017, meeting with uh, senators and reps, State Department staff, as well as the DOD. Um, if you want a future relationship with the people of Yemen or the region at large, you need to immediately withdraw military support from the coalition and lift the blockade. As Yemen as a, as a weak, fragile state will be a thing of the past moving forward. And today, I say this to you, and I hope there are actual like government officials and staff watching at the moment. Um, do not be like those who thought killing 500,000 children in Iraq was worth the price. We stand today in witness of where that policy has taken the US, and it seems to be on its way out of Iraq. The same could happen on the peninsula with these types of policies, policies that no conscious human can accept. And I say this out of a genuine concern as a US citizen. 
of Yemeni origin. Do the right thing. Lift the blockade and the war. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, Bruce Rydell. Um, I, th I think there's a consensus here. D-Link ceasefire from the lift of the blockade. Um, the linkage, ironically, puts the Houthis and with the Iranians in the driver's seat. They get to veto ending the humanitarian crisis because they can keep fighting. It's hard to see why Iran would ever want to fight the war. Uh, this is a war that costs them nothing, costs the Saudis a fortune, and has damaged not only Saudi international credibility, but also American international. I think it's also time to stop having delusions in Washington about the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, thinking that he can be educated or controlled. That's a delusion. It's a fantasy. Time has proven that's not the case. I'll go one step further, too. I think in demanding an end to the blockade, the United States ought to start saying very clearly if the blockade continues, then we will have to look into war crimes. This is, is dangerous to go into. And I think it's time to start making it clear there will be consequences to those involved in perpetuating this war that go beyond what happens in their own country, those who are international leaders. Thank you. And Hassan? Um, thank you so much. I completely agree. We must decouple the blockade from ongoing negotiations. The Yemeni people should not be held hostage. And I really urge that U.S. policymakers take a lesson from the ma last major diplomatic success in Yemen. After the Houthis took control of Sana'a in 2014, Yemeni uh, warring political factions began an internal Yemeni peace negotiations and were on the verge of a power sharing deal. Um, that uh, that was uh, basically put together by UN envoy Jamal Ben Omar in one of Jamal Ben Omar's latest op-eds. You know, he was he said he was completely shocked that Saudi Arabia began dropping bombs outside his hotel window while he was still in Sana on this diplomatic mission. And I think we should take a lesson from that. And what's clear is that military intervention in in Yemen by regional and international actors has really only caused more suffering for the people of Yemen. And uh, these regional and international actors really must stop fueling the war so Yemen can figure out a solution on Yemen's terms and they can figure out a how to facilitate a ceasefire and an agreement between the warring parties um, and bring an end to this blockade. What we need to do is, you know, get the U.S. to end our military support and political support for the Saudi-led coalition and the blockade on Yemen. I would consider that if we don't get answers soon, Congress should really be empowered to take action, uh, putting out statements, consider, uh, you know, introducing a new war powers resolution to cut off military support uh, for the Saudi-led coalition's war in Yemen. You know, we don't at this point know. Um, what you, what we actually have cut off. So I think can, Congress should feel empowered to, to move ahead. We can also push through provisions for the National Defense Authorization Act to end military support, uh, to condemn the blockade and to cut off any military support to the blockade. I just urge that you know, now is really the time to pick up on the momentum of this week, double down on our efforts and continue amplifying each other's great work on this on this space. And I um, just really grateful for the opportunity to chat with everybody today. Thank you, Hassan. And now I'm going to turn to the Q&A. We have a few more minutes left. This is a question directly to Bruce. Um, Bruce, you say it's a slam dunk that the blockade is an offensive operation. You say that the Saudis are enforcing the blockade by sea and air, that the Saudi Air Force is 75% U.S. supplied that if the US ends logistic support for the Saudi Air Force tonight, the Saudi Air Force is grounded tomorrow. Is it not then more accurate to call it a US-Saudi blockade? Does this not implicate Congress 
if the US is participating in an act of war that Congress has not authorized? And does this not implicate Article One of the Constitution and the War Powers Resolution of 1973? Congress invoked the WPR to call the question on US participation under Trump, why not now? And why aren't, aren't we calling for this? I know that was multiple questions, but it's regarding, uh, yeah, the WPR and implication of Congress. Well, certainly the, the, the question accurately quotes it. And I think the conclusion that the question draws is the correct one. This has been a US supported um, blockade. We have been a participant in this for at least the last six years. And the Biden administration has so far given lip service to the idea of ending an offensive military operation, but I don't see any uh, actual uh, effort. Um, so it's time to get rid of our delusions about the Saudis, about this war. And yes, Congress needs to act. Um, the War Powers Authorization Act that was passed after 9-11 has been stretched so far. Uh, you could run a, you could even run a, a 747 through this language. You could run an American carrier battle group through this language. Um, whatever the Houthis are, they're not an Al Qaeda organized related organization. Um, we need the War Powers Act to be amended. We need to stop support for the war. And as I said, we need to start saying seriously. There will be international legal um, responsibilities uh, for those who are continuing to perpetuate the war from here on out. Thank you. Um, there's a question here, and I think, Mohammed, you might be best positioned to answer it. Have any more ships entered the port of Hodeida since the Thuryu, which docked at Hodeida on March 25th? Media reports say that the Saudis have cleared three additional ships, but are those ships moving toward Hodeida? Uh, and please unmute yourself, Mohammed, if you have thoughts on this. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there were um, three ships that were allowed to go in, but they weren't for public. They weren't uh, ships carrying fuel uh, for the, for the public sector. They were for private individuals and private factories. And so um, the ships that were um, that were carrying a lot more fuel for um, for the public sector uh, are still being detained. And there were two uh, ships that left uh, to another destination um, uh, because they were detained for you know over two hundred days. So they were there for about a year, um, incurring costs. Um, uh, and so uh, they just left. Um, so I'm not a uh, if, if that's the if, that, if those are the ships that they're that, that the person asking the question is referring to, um, that's my answer. I'm not too sure. Thank um, you. Yes, Aisha. I, yeah. So yes, four ships presumably were allowed in or to dock. One was for WFP, and three, as Mohammed said, were for the private sector. None for the public sector. Another question here, uh, assuming that the blockade is lifted, are there plans to get relief to Yemen ASAP? Presumably people will need food and medicine before the Yemeni economy can recover and Yemenis will need humanitarian aid in the meantime. Hassan, perhaps you can speak to this um, regarding um, the US's role in aid in Yemen or Aisha or whoever wants to take this question. Maybe Aisha. I can, okay, um, so basically if we're, uh, if the blockade is lifted, a lot of the UN has a lot of ships. Actually, today there was a report of WFP food that went into Yemen that was had expired, and they had to, you know, burn a whole shipment. And the reason for that is the block. These ships, even with UN food that's donated to Yemen, are you know not allowed to go in. And by the time they get in the food had expired. We have experienced that ourselves when we got cancer medicine uh, in 2018 donated to Yemen. By the time it got to Yemen, it was 2019. And although we asked the company to ship it with you know, an extended uh, time before it expires, 
one of the medicine uh, only had 28 days before it expired when it entered uh, Aden uh, port. And then to get it from Aden to the cancer centers by the time we got it there, one medicine was no longer uh, viable. So yes, we need to get uh, a lot in, but also there are a lot of businesses in the commercial sector that can uh, support bringing items in and, and not just food, but a lot of things to start building the economy. Um, and Martha had said that there was purposeful targeting of food production in Yemen. There was also purposeful targeting of everything that makes money in Yemen, whether it's a cement factory, whether, and so, and then a lot of, for example, I'll tell you the hospitals because I work very closely with the health sector in Yemen. A lot of their equipments are old and they're not even able to get in spare parts to fix them, let alone buy new equipment. So the, if the blockade is lifted today, there is a lot that needs to come in. And the private sector, the commercial sector is extremely important for Yemen to, because as I said early on, Yemen cannot depend on aid. We cannot have every year, you know, uh, you know plead for countries that are, you know, bombing Yemen, that are starving the population to, you know, begging them to provide aid to Yemen. We need to have the commercial sector. We need to have people go back to their uh, works. It will be a slow process, but it, you know, we have to start. If I could just add a little bit, it's not a ton I would add to that because I should just spoke so well about it. Um, a lot of people talk about obstruction and the blockade as like they're equal, uh, you know, equal crimes on Yemenis. But I really look at root causes of violence. And this is what I try to let people know is that the blockade actually incentivizes obstruction. It creates this scarcity issue. And, you know, the Hadi government, the Houthis are exploiting that scarcity and it's perpetuating more obstruction so if we want to end obstruction i think the the thing we should be doing is trying to end the blockade and it'll have a follow-on result the only other thing i'd mention is that if folks have not seen the explosive cnn report uh by an amazing reporter uh um, at nima she is just fantastic sudanese journalist with cnn um, they f did some amazing film work in Hodeida, and you see lines and lines of trucks that are, you know, basically waiting to get fuel from these ships that are being kept off Babel Mendeb Strait uh, and to be able to deliver their food products to millions of Yemenis, and food is rotting as a result. So immediately getting in those ships could get those trucks working and get this food aid delivered to where it needs to go. So that's just really a, a huge concern and a pressing issue that could be resolved tomorrow if we let these ships in. Thank you. And, and one of the questions cites this report and the follow-up question to that is, are those trucks um, still waiting in those lines? Are they still stuck? Are they still not able to deliver food because they had no fuel? kind of like latest updates in the last couple of weeks, I guess, is what this person is asking. Maybe Mohammed has a, a kind of an update. I, I haven't seen much on those specific trucks. Uh, yes. Um, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware either exactly, but I'm pretty sure they're probably still out there. Nothing's changed. There's nothing that's come in. So Nothing's changed. I don't, Thank I don't you. think, I don't think that they would just, you know, that they would leave. Um, I mean, they're there waiting for to be loaded, right? And to have, uh, you know, to transport fuel and whatever the imports are. And so the, uh, nothing's come in, so I doubt that they've done anything. They've, they've gone anywhere. Yeah, uh, I see that Charles, sorry, Mohammed. Uh, Charles Pearson in the comments said that the ships that came in did not have petrol. Uh, so they may have diesel and cooking gas, but not petrol. Okay. Thank you, Charles, for that. Thank you. And this question perhaps is for you, Professor Martha Mundy. Um, given that the Western aid led the country away from its self-sufficiency, is any of the fuel being blockaded renewable? Um, do we know, if, for example, there are solar pan panels or infrastructure supplies? Similarly, do any of the food supplies include seeds or agricultural supplies to help ensure self-sufficiency? 
in a transition towards self-sufficiency and renewable energy, is this part of the plans for rebuilding the economy? Uh, I, I will answer insofar as I know. The first, I, I do understand that there's been quite massive, for anyone who has the means, massive uh, transition to solar panels for the generation, at least of lighting in, in Yemen. Uh, clearly, uh, there are certain things you can do with solar panels and also even for um, up to a certain degree for um, irrigation pumps or for, for lift pumps. Uh, so I think that the war has pressed people and, and cert certainly, I mean, this is informal information and others may know more about the quantities, but I certainly think it's moved in that direction. The second thing I would emphasize, it wasn't that it was Western aid. Well, it was, I mean, uh, in the 1970s, yes, PL 480 American wheat was, you know, a huge factor in, in um, uh, undercutting the, the grain economies, not only in Yemen, but also in Egypt, uh, when, when, you know, uh, American uh, grain aid, uh, was played an important role, but in general, uh, it, it's not aid, but it's been policy. And I can give the kind of articles that I, I've written with agronomists. And that leads me to a remark of my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Amin Al-Hakimi of San'an University, who has often emphasized how worried some of the agronomists are in the Faculty of Agriculture about um, the kinds of seeds that NGOs are bringing in because often they are not suitable. Um, so I understand from the Faculty of Agriculture in Sana'a that one of their main aims is to, uh, because there's been a big loss in of all the seed banks, by the way, for lack of fuel in Yemen over, over the course of the war, is to do reproduction of native seeds and try to rebuild uh, that uh, that kind of thing, which answers. And there is one more aspect that's uh, immediately relevant. Yes, um, I have been following some of the um, uh, all, all that's ever said about Ansar Allah or the Houthis is that they're you know um, as Bruce Rydell was putting it, thugs and so forth. But there is quite a push in Sana'a, and it's there in the uh, statement for a modern state in Yemen by Ansar Allah, and it's there in what the Ministry of Agriculture and Irrigation is doing at present. Because they come from a marginal rural area, some of these guys, there is much more attention to um, <clears throat> uh, the rural sector, giving prizes to farmers, trying to revive uh, certain kinds of um, uh, areas for farming. So I think that in a, in a weird way, there is a uh, reflection going on from what I gather at a distance, it's not like being on the ground, uh, in Sana'a about very much and critical voices. In fact, a paper, paper I wrote with Amin, critical voices of the direction and with Frederic Pella the direction of policy over the years. So I don't think, uh, it, you know, um, reaction cannot be built on inside Yemen. But uh, yeah, and so it wasn't just eight. I'm sorry, I went on a little long, but it was a multi multiple question, yeah. And thank you so much. To, uh, I'm sorry, I, I want to confirm what Martha just said, uh, that yes, solar panels are used extensively in Yemen, I was there in 2019 and traveled throughout the country and it's used even for water pumps for irrigation. And yes, there is a, a strong move into uh, you know, agriculture and there is a lot of support, including a recent report that just came this month, but what's happening in Njof in terms of uh, agriculture, the report basically said that in the last year, uh, the support for agriculture in Njof is more than what had happened in 30 years in Yemen. Sorry, uh, Shireen, I just wanted to say these things. Thank you so much for that addition, Dr. Jaman. And we will leave it at this. There are still some questions that have not been answered in the Q&A. Unfortunately, we are out of time. But if you still have questions that you would like to pass on to the panelists, uh, please email uh, Kavan at C-A-V-A-N at demandprogress.org and we will get your questions out. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us on this panel today and for sharing your insights.